my mother met him in, in New York at Harmon in 1931, and my father had met him the same year in 1931 in England. So I wanted to go back and give you some of that background on that. It all starts with Baba sending Rustam to England in 1928 to find uh, some English boys for his school. Uh, most of you know about the schools that Baba had in, in India, and Rustam was the first link from the east to the west. It was the first time Baba had ever sent one of his monoli to the west. And he didn't, he didn't uh, find any English boys to go back, but he did meet some people in England and talk to them about Baba. And one of the people that he met in England was Meredith Starr, who had studied mysticism and the occult and was interested in finding, <laughs> seeking the guidance of a, of a living master at that time. So Rustam was called back to India by Baba and Meredith, and about maybe two months after that, Meredith actually went to India with two ladies. Uh, Margarita Starr was his wife and her sister Esther. These two ladies were the older sisters of my father, whose name was Kenneth Roth. And they stayed at the ashram in Toka. At that time, Baba had moved the whole school from Mirabad to Toka. They actually stayed there for six months. And I guess Meredith was making kind of a nuisance of himself. He happened to be a rather arrogant, egocentric kind of person. And he would uh, really annoy the Mondali. And they finally, they were complaining to Baba about him. So he finally, I mean, six months is a long time to stay somewhere. Un uninvited, more or less. And um, so Baba sent them back to England <clears throat> with the idea that he would uh, establish a place where Baba could come and, and make contact with people in the West. So Baba, or uh, Maris, did come back to England and I think the next year established a spiritual retreat in um, a place in Devonshire. I don't know how many people here are familiar with it, with it there. It's about 200 miles north of London, and it was near the village of Coombe Martin. Coombe Martin's known to have the longest main street of any village in England. The re retreat itself is called East Shalakum. Um, my daughter and I actually went to visit this place in 1999. It's a beautiful, beautiful setting. Uh, the farmhouse is set like in a valley and there's like terraced hills for miles and miles around. I think it was actually 60 acres belonging to the farm. And then you have the, the cliffs uh, like, like along the Big Sur in, in um, California. It's like drop off cliffs and very wild ocean. And we stayed in a little bed and breakfast uh, right on the main street and we could walk up through the hills and walk on the hills where Baba had walked with, with the English uh, disciples that were there, the people that came to see him. And I remember walking up the hill there and the feeling of serenity and peace up there. It was so reminiscent of how you feel up on Seclusion Hill. I think Baba's presence is still very strong there. And also, um, in front of the house, they don't let you in the house now when you go to visit, but the, the mother of the people that live there lives next door, and she, she let us walk around the, around the ground outside. And I have a picture, you probably can't see it, but I don't know if you can put it on the video, can you? Mm. Um, this is, shows this house, and it shows Baba with a group of the, of the people that were there. My father's there. Danny looking over his shoulder. And you see in this picture, there's Danny on a stoop. You can't really see it. I don't know if I should send it around. People want to see yeah, it. Yeah. Um, and the house looks kind of grayish. But when, when we went, the house was um, uh, all painted white, very clean looking. And, but you could recognize the house from the from the pictures of the farmhouse. And the stoop that they're standing on was like exactly the same. It was just a wonderful, a wonderful feeling for me to be there, to stand there and look at that stoop where Baba is standing there and to know that, that my father was there as a young man. It was, a, it was really special, a special feeling. 
So um, Meredith had very strict rules about running this ashram. He used to make them meditate four hours every day, and I, I guess he was rather bossy about how he did things. But a couple people that went there before Baba came were uh, Herbert Davy, Kitty Davy's brother, and she went. He went and told Kitty about Baba, and Margaret Kress also stayed there uh, before Baba actually came. Um, uh, Baba came in the fall of, of uh, 1931, I think in September actually, and a lot of the early English group met him at that time. And I wanted to mention that uh, my father played the bagpipes and one of the things that he did for, was to play the bagpipes for Baba. So there's a little article in here, uh, a couple of newspapers wrote up articles about Baba coming to, to uh, Devonshire, and <clears throat> this, says, this is uh, Manchester Guardian, April 18th, which happened to be his birthday, 19, this is actually 1932, the next year he came, but um, Indian mystic in Devonshire, bagpipes greeting at Shalakun. <laughs> it says, um, uh, Walking with the secretary and party through the muddy lane to the retreat at East Shalakum, where he is to stay, Sri Meher Baba gazed admiringly at the wildflowers and the hedgerows. As he reached the retreat, there was a picturesque scene. Mr. Kenneth Ross, a brother-in-law of Mr. Meredith Starr and an expert player of the bagpipes, was piping Mayor Baba through the farm and marching up and down on the grassy terrace playing the pipes. He would always walk when he when he played the bagpipes. He never stood still. He always had to be marching up and down. I, I remember when we were kids he would be marching up and down the kitchen floor playing the pipes and, <laughs> and one day a neighbor about a mile down the road came down to see what was that terrible noise. He couldn't figure out what it was. <laughs> I always loved the bagpipes. And the other, um, the other paper um, uh, wrote as uh, Sri Mayor Baba came close to the house, Mr. Kenneth Ross, a Scotsman and brother-in-law of Mr. Meredith Starr, rushed to the terrace fronting the house and set up a wild squirreling of the bagpipes. I love that scene. <laughs> and while we're on the bagpipes, I have to read to Margaret Kress a little story, because I love this story. I hope you like it too. Um, this is when, when Margaret, I think the first visit in 1931, uh, this is from her book, Dance, Dance of Love. You're all familiar with that, probably. Uh, it was a beautiful experience to be with Baba for the first time. He was unbelievably beautiful, not just physically, but lighted up with a spiritual beauty. One afternoon, we were sitting with Baba on a steep hillside, a very craggy place, not a piece of smooth ground anywhere. Suddenly, Baba's face lighted up as if he had had a world-shaking inspiration, and he spelled on the alphabet board, Margaret shall dance for us. Now you have to remember that Margaret was a classical ballet dancer, for those of you who didn't know. I was horrified. First, there did not seem to be a flat piece of ground anywhere on which one could dance. Second, I had on clumping country boots and a tightish, thick tweed skirt, <laughs> in which it was impossible to lift a leg or step out. And third, I was convinced, rightly, that I should make a fool of myself. And I wish to say that in all the years I was with Baba, I never did dance my best for him. There was always a snag. No music, no space, nothing that is essential for one to perform as an artist. On this occasion, all my pride and work came to the surface and had its first battering from Baba. It's rather like being a goat. From crag to crag, I leapt, <laughs> accompanying the leaps by a few flappy arm movements. No meaning at all. It could not have been worse, and it certainly did not help. And Kenneth Ross produced his bagpipes and started them off <laughs> whining and wheezing. She didn't, like, she didn't like bagpipes. I think you either, either love them or you don't. <laughs> so one of the people that, um, that came to the retreat in 1931 to meet Baba was an American named Thomas Watson. And he had, as a young man, uh, 
worked with Alexander Graham Bell to uh, produce the first telephone. In fact, the first words over the telephone were, Watson, come here, I need you, because Bell had spilled some acid on his clothes and Watson was in the other room and they didn't realize the phone was working. So at this time, Watson was in his late 70s and he was touring around England with a, with a um, theater company and he was interested in the arts and also in spiritual uh, matters and um, uh, he, when he met Baba, had a very extreme experience. I guess he wasn't expecting it. He didn't know what to expect, you know, what Baba was like or what to expect when he met Baba, but, but Baba um, put, put his hand on his head and Watson uh, started weeping like some, so many people do when they meet Baba. They have, they just weep and weep. And he was very touched by that and uh, he, he um, actually decided that Baba should come to America, that America needs, needs him. So he invited uh, Baba to come to America and this hadn't been in the itinerary though, of course, I'm sure Baba had it all planned all along, but nobody else knew about it. And <laughs> so uh, Watson um, offered to help finance the trip also. And in the meantime, <clears throat> in, the meantime in America, Jean and Malcolm Schloss, who were, um, co had owned a bookstore in, in uh, New York called the North Node Bookstore, uh, had heard about Baba and they were planning to come to England, but then they were told that he wasn't, that they was coming to America. So they were asked to find a place for Baba to, to uh, meet, meet the American people who wanted to meet him. So Jean Sloss, her maiden name is Adriel. And she wrote a wonderful book called Avatar, which I don't know if you've all read, but it's one of the best Baba books, I think. Um, she had a friend named Margaret Mayo who had a, a home at a little place called Carmen on Hudson, which is a whistle stop in the train between New York and Albany, uh, maybe an hour out of Albany, out of New York. And her friend offered the house uh, to Baba to have to meet people there for the whole duration of his trip. So, so uh, subsequently, Baba went there and and met people. And one of the people that uh, came to see him um, was a friend of. Watson's was was um, my mother's mother called Mary Ant Mary Anton, uh, who um, also was was a spiritual seeker, and uh, Watson sent word to her that she should be sure to come and that Baba was coming to America and she should be sure to go and see him. So she did. Subsequently, she went to visit him and she was very interested in him and was very touched by him, but. She had a, a rather intellectual approach to Baba and eventually she turned away from Baba and studied, uh, I think she went into um, anthroposophy with, with Rudolf Steiner. But uh, in the meantime, she brought Mother to, to, uh, to meet him and that's what you'll see mm -hmm. in, the, in the film that we're going to see here. Um, a lot of the early, early, um, American followers of Baba met him at that time. Uh, Jean was a friend of Narina's and she brought Narina and Elizabeth Patterson, <coughs> excuse me, Patterson also. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about Mary Anton. She, she had um, come from Russia as a young girl. She actually came to America in uh, 1894, the same year that Baba was born. And she, uh, very quickly assimilated into American life. She loved America because in Russia she came from uh, the Jewish part where the, well, the Jewish people were kept in an area called the Pale and they weren't allowed to, to, to the girls weren't allowed to go to school and in, in America she could go to the libraries, they had free schools and she was, she really um, appreciated that and and learned all she could and, and um, she, she wrote letters to her uncle back in Russia when she was quite a young girl, which, which were published. And she, a lot of people became interested in her because she was very bright and they, they uh, helped her out. 
And she became, actually, she wrote her life story called The Promised Land, which is a uh, story of her immigrating from Russia to America. I think she wrote it when she was only 29, so she didn't have her whole life behind her. And she also uh, lectured all over the country uh, on many subjects that were pertinent to the day, um, immigration, education, and she was also interested in Zionism. And it says in one, on one occasion, she, over 1,000 people gathered at the Waldorf Astoria in New York to hear Boston writer Mary Ant. When I read that, I was like, wow, 1,000 <laughs> people. And she was only a little bitty thing. She was only five foot two. But um, in the film um, that you're going to see tonight, there's a, a little girl on there. That's my daughter, Jean, who's now grown up and a, and a mother herself. And um, uh, they, I guess they had me talk a, talk a little bit about about our um, meeting with Baba, which for us as a family, my two sisters and me first got to meet Baba in 1952 uh, when he was at Mrs. Deuce's house after after his accident after Oklahoma. He went to New York in July and and. Um, they were planning to maybe cancel those meetings because of Bob is still being uh, suffering from the accident. He still had his his arm and his leg in a cast, and uh, but he did decide to go through with with the interviews. and And our family, we lived in a in um, South Jersey in the Pine Barrens of South Jersey, about 150 miles from New York City, and in those days. Money was very scarce. We had an old, old car, 1939 Oldsmobile. I remember that. Okay. And our our interview with Baba was at seven in the morning, very early. So I remember, I do remember getting up in the dark and getting in the car. I remember that very clearly. And the other thing that are that um, when I think about it now, it's like my God, uh, we we had chickens. We had a chicken farm. So we could only go for one day because we had to be back to feed the chickens that night. I'm thinking, my God, here's Baba, you know, and, and I see the films of other people hanging out in the hotel and Baba throwing fruit to them and everything, and we have to go home and feed the chickens. <laughs> anyway, we, you know, you can't complain. You got to be, you got to be grateful, you know, for what you get. And to me, Baba, I mean, how can you, how can you top that? But, but it's funny and and. Um, at that time, as children, I, I don't think that we ever really appreciated what that, what that was because, because I forgot to mention that um, <coughs> Kenneth married my mother. Maybe, maybe you picked that up somewhere <laughs> along. <now. laughs> anyway. <laughs> So we were brought up because both of them had met Baba, and they both uh, stayed with Baba for all their lives. Although it's interesting, on both sides, uh, the people that brought them to Baba left Baba. Uh, Mary Anton left Baba, and so did Mary the Star subsequently, a couple of years later. But my mother and father both stayed with Baba all their lives. And so we were, as children, you know, we learned about Baba, and I remember... Um, the first time I actually mentioned Baba to other children on the school bus, I remember it very clearly. They didn't know who Baba was. They thought it was, what are you talking about? Yeah, it was like so weird to me. Like, how come they don't know about Baba? <laughs> 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 like, but it was, it was very, in, in those days, um, we were like the closest Baba people were 150 miles away in New York City. And we were good friends with the Shaws who lived in Schenectady, which was another 150 miles, 300 miles away. So I remember that they used to write letters a lot. Daddy would write a lot of letters all the time. I hear that typewriter going with the two fingers you know, all night long. So uh, they kept in touch with other people, but we didn't hardly ever see anybody else that knew about Bob. But the Shaws did come down to visit a couple of times when we were quite young. And I remember Sam Cohen came, John Bass. A few people like that from New York, but not very many. So it was a totally different experience growing up 
in those days uh, with Baba because there was no um, there was no use of havas. There were no um, there was no gatherings. There was no there was no music. I don't think there were any Baba songs. I can remember any music. Um, there were maybe two books. I can remember Avatar and um, the Wayfarers. I don't remember you know, the discourses. I'm sure and and some Baba pictures. But still, you know, he was very present in our lives. It's just that it was, it, was, it was so different from today's world. And it's so nice now to be a part of this whole Baba community and to have the camaraderie of other people who, who understand what you're talking about when you mention Mayor Baba. You know? <laughs>